So uh, we are happy to have Professor Kiesling talk about selective history of non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics. He will talk about uh, for an hour, for an hour. Uh, and then there will be uh, followed up by, by discussion when you can ask your questions. Uh, and uh, OK, let's start. OK, thanks, Shadi. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, so I don't repeat the abstract here in my slides, but I can briefly remind you that uh, the purpose here is not to give an, <laughs> a precise history of all the things that happened, even though Okay, can you hear me again? I think Shadi muted me. Yes, we hear you. Okay, good. So, all right, folks. So, um, I was just saying that uh, the purpose is not to give an accurate history of all the things that happened. Uh, first of all, that doesn't fit into an hour, uh, but uh, it would actually give you a sense of uh, where all the mess comes from in quantum mechanics. Instead, I want to give a selective history, so cherry-picked, mostly non-relativistic. I put that actually the non in parentheses because it, it won't be possible to completely ignore relativity, of course, in the story. And um, the purpose is to convey that by cherry-picking, if you focus on the right things, that there is a relatively straight path to a reasonable way of thinking about quantum mechanics, and it's not the textbook way, of course. Okay, so I think it's really necessary to start where it all began before anybody was thinking quantum. And uh, so I will spend a little bit of time initially on uh, the black body radiation spectrum, because of course, quantum physics eventually starts with a success story of finding this formula. Uh, by Max Planck, but it's important to see how it actually came about. So first, what is a black body? Well, the definition I have down here, by definition, a black, truly black body absorbs any incoming radiation. So there's no reflection of any sort. And at temperature T in thermal equilibrium with the radiation, uh, it's a perfect balance. So it absorbs as much as it emits per unit of time and at each frequency. Okay, and the guy who introduced that concept was Gustav Robert Kirchhoff, a mathematical physicist in Königsberg, and that was 1860. So he did many great things, but uh, one of them was inventing the notion of a black body. And here is what he found. So he showed that the spectral radiation density, I will explain that a little bit later, it's called radiance of a black body in thermal equilibrium with its radiation is independent of the shape of the body and independent of the material that it's made of. So in other words, that spectral function, so the energy radiated per unit of time, per unit of frequency, per unit of solid angle, per unit area through which it's being emitted, is a function only of frequency and temperature. Uh, and so U for universal function. Okay, so now the race was on to find such a universal function. So you don't need to care about whether your stove, if you think of that as a black body, is a cylinder or a cube or whatever. So lots of empirical measurements were made and empirically the curve basically looks like that. So here down there is the frequency, here's the radiance function and for three different temperatures I've plotted this. So of course I plot it, but the measurements that were made could be interpolated very accurately by curves that looked like that. Okay, and the temperature increases with the height of the curve. So this is low temperature, medium temperature, and this is high temperature. Okay, and there's a unique maximum always that I denote the maximum at a unique frequency that depends on the temperature. So here's then a first very important signpost in 1879, so that's almost 20 years later, Based on the empirical data, Josef Stefan uh, proposed that the integrated amount of energy per unit of time, per unit of solid angle, per unit of area, right? But no longer per unit frequency because it integrates over the frequencies, that this is a constant times the fourth power of the temperature. 
So that's called Stefan's law. And the constant is nowadays called Stefan's constant and was an empirical constant at the time. So he didn't know what was the function u, but he knew what the integral was, okay? All right, next is very important person enters the stage, that is 1884, Boltzmann. He derives Stefan's law by applying thermodynamic principle of the ideal heat engines to heat radiation instead of an ideal gas. So if you do it for the ideal gas, think of the industrial revolution, steam engine, etc. That was well, definitely early in the 19th century, so Boltzmann was an expert in that. But also in the 1890s, he works on the statistical mechanics of atoms, and he actually succeeds in deriving the thermodynamics of continuum matter, that is how you perceive it at every day's level, in thermal equilibrium. So he applies statistical mechanics ideas to Newtonian mechanics, but of a huge number of tiny atoms, and uh, lays the foundations, the beginning of equilibrium statistical mechanics. He also does non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, but we don't need that for this talk. Now enter 1893. So we are already quite far. That's 33 years after Kirchhoff. Wilhelm Wien uh, finds a relationship between the point in the frequency axis where the maximum occurs and the temperature. And he finds that this is just a linear relationship. So he didn't write it exactly like this. He introduced a single constant that was B, but he wrote it in terms of wavelengths. And uh, well, I'm taking a little bit advantage here that we know that heat radiation is electromagnetic radiation that propagates with the speed of light. So I wrote it for the frequency, and then the speed of light enters here. Okay. So this is Willy Wien. But he even goes further, three years later. So now, why I had mentioned Stefan's law already, uh, this became a signpost, so that had to be true. Whatever your u is, it has to produce Stefan's law when you integrate it. And the displacement law was true because of thermodynamic principles, had to be true too. So therefore, now he applied heuristically Boltzmann's ideas of statistical mechanics in equilibrium, right, at temperature T to radiation at frequency nu. So this was really some very heuristic analog reasoning, and he basically used the distribution of the energy of an ideal gas of all the particles. They have velocities. There's actually the Maxwell distribution. Maxwell is another person that I mentioned right here. He appears later again with a photo. And uh, so if you asked what is the distribution of the energy for an ideal gas, you find that it's proportional to the fourth power of velocity times the exponential function of negative the second power of velocity divided by temperature with some constants involved. So what Wien said, let's try frequency to some power times the exponential function of negative frequency to some other power divided by t. Okay, and let's figure out what the powers are or clock. So now here's Stefan's law, he has the displacement law, and he fiddles around a little bit and comes up that this has to be it. Not only this, he also matches, in fact, uh, his, uh, he needs one more information. He matches uh, this expression with, a, with a, an extra parameter, let's say here and there. So he knows that the powers of this plus that minus one have to be three, that follows from there. And then he matches it to empirical results, defines this power must be three, so that other th thing has to be therefore uh, zero, so you get zero plus one is one, so u to the one. Okay, so he ends up here, and it turns out that this is pretty accurate for large frequencies and moderate temperatures, but at small frequencies, given any temperature, it says that this becomes temperature independent, just a third power of frequency, and that is empirically false. Measurements were much closer to the second power of frequency, and moreover, it was temperature dependent. The more heat you put into the stove, right, also uh, the more energy is being radiated, right, at the frequency range. So moreover, you can see e to negative a positive constant is less than one, so the spectral 
radiance function is always bounded by a times nu q, and that's also empirically false when you make t larger and larger. So something was amiss. Now we go to 1900, getting very close to the introduction of the quantum. So Lord Rayleigh, and then a few years later, he's joined by, uh, by James Hotwood Jeans. Here you see the two fellows. Uh, they apply Boltzmann statistical mechanics to Maxwell's electromagnetic field equation. That means they look at all the eigenmodes in some hollow sphere, let's say, or in a cube, because it doesn't depend on what you should take in terms of geometry. And here's Mr. Maxwell. And uh, they derive, for all frequencies actually, this form of the radiance function, including a constant. So the, they, they didn't know about Kb in 1900, not when Rayleigh really did it, of course, in 1905, they knew about it, and you will see in a second why. But uh, so therefore, that confirmed the empirical result at small frequencies and was clearly uh, not what, what Wien's law said. Right? And moreover, they had some constant here. And so Max Planck decided, um, all right, uh, maybe one can interpolate between the two regimes. And here's his interpolation formula, right? So it is a new cube, of course, right? And when this exponent here is very large, you can ignore the minus one and it becomes indeed uh, Wien's law for large frequency given temperature, let's say. On the other hand, when you make that exponent very small, you can make a Taylor series. You have one plus this term here downstairs and then you subtract the one, you get just H nu over KT but it's one over it, so you flip it up, it kills one power of nu, it brings up the t, so you get nu squared t, great. All right? so he interpolates between both regimes, he looks at the empirical data, and he finds this matches fantastically, and now he is out to try to cook up some story that could microscopically, quote unquote, lead to this formula. And somehow he proposes that when Radiation is being emitted, well, it has some energy, and uh, so that uh, this clearly has to correspond to some change of energy then in the material of the black body that is emitting it. And he, uh, he proposes that that can only happen in integer multiples of h times nu. He introduces this quantum of action nu. And, uh, but by the way, that energy should be proportional to frequency. Now look, this part here came from Willy Wien and the empirical accuracy. So that was already in 1896. It was clear that somehow energy, you know, so in Boltzmann's theory, statistical mechanics is always in the exponent, you have the ratio of energy divided by up to a constant factor temperature. So this had to be an energy. So, but that it can only hop in integer multiples. So basically that is his new ad hoc assumption. And then he, derives this formula from the geometric series and a little bit more. Okay. Now, I said it was a universal function. It was realized because it was independent of the shape of the body and independent of the material. But uh, it was in the 20th century then discovered that there is this cosmic microwave background radiation. That's of course from a very recent data and uh, from what you see in the heavens, if you one. So, so the continuous curve is the Planck formula, and those arrow bars here, these are measurements fluctuating around, now, but uh, mind you, these arrow bars are 400 sigma arrow bars. Normally you see these things with six sigma or so. If they would put six sigma, you don't see any errors. It's smack on, right? So this is a fantastic, the precise uh, agreement between Planck's formula and the microwave background radiation in the universe. So it's also in this sense a truly universal function. Okay, so now finally there is the, the quantum H in the story and we go on. And uh, around that time, so that scatters a little bit around 1900 here. Uh, so I switched from black body now to what is called electrons, photons and their ghost fields. Okay, okay. So, so first, what is an atom of electricity? Well, that was speculated by atomists 
to be the carrier of electricity. So there was speculation, of course, that matter is made of atoms and it was realized that matter is somehow electric. So it was not too far-fetched to speculate that there is also some basic unit of electricity that was called the atom of electricity and was later named electron. And uh, it was discovered, this electron, in 1897 by Emil Wichert, uh, shortly after that also by Thomson. And uh, what they did is they looked at cathode rays in vacuum tubes, and so they had been discovered before. That was some nice blue shining uh, light coming out of those vacuum tubes, but it wasn't really vacuum, right? There was some residual gas in there, and that's why you saw this bluish uh, shimmer coming out of that. And the issue was, was that a new type of electromagnetic radiation? Uh, mind you, X-rays were also discovered uh, shortly after. Or was it, in fact, emission of some charged particles? That was a question. Uh, and so they uh, figured that to make vacuum tubes better and better and apply the electric and magnetic fields, and they deflected the rays. And if it's electromagnetic radiation, that would not happen. So it was apparently charged matter that was uh, in these tubes, and so they uh, measured the mass and the uh, charge to mass ratio, and uh, so therefore conclude what the charge should be, and it was subsequently measured by Millikan separately, uh, the charge, I mean. And, uh, but Wichert then, he was in Königsberg, like Kirchhoff earlier, and he became the first professor of geophysics ever in the world, theoretical geophysics, in Göttingen. So he stopped doing what he was doing, moved to Göttingen, and became a very esteemed seismologist and a forgotten physicist. There's actually a paper with exactly that title. So 1902, then Henrik Lorenz, oh, this is the guy, he is awarded the Nobel Prize for his electron theory. Nowadays called classical electron theory. So he has a theory trying to merge the tiny structure called electron, the dynamics that it has with Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. And he wins the Nobel Prize for his work. And Thomson, in 1906, wins the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the electron. So while Wichert became a seismologist, Thomson kept hacking away at uh, the discovery of the electron in one publication after another. And so uh, he, what, most what we learned about the electron at the time is indeed through his work. And he was awarded the Nobel Prize. Good. Now, 1905, enter Mr. Einstein. In his wondrous year, where not only does he invent special theory of relativity and concludes that any mass is associated with energy in this proportionality, something similar was known for electromagnetic energy, but with a different factor before, 20 years earlier, by the way. Uh, he introduces quanta of light with something similar like what Planck said, but while Planck said that uh, it's the energy can only be absorbed or admitted in jumps, but otherwise it's continuously in the field. Einstein says, no, 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 no. There are particles of light, quanta of light, later called photons, and they carry this energy. And the energy they carry is associated with the frequency of the wave that corresponds also to the light. He didn't say, however, that particles are waves. So he uses this idea to explain the photoelectric effect successfully. And he also explains Brown in motion using statistical mechanics of atoms, computes the size of the atoms, and yeah. <clears throat> uh, from then on, people, the physicists, start taking atoms more seriously. Chemists did that long ago, anyhow. But Einstein also keeps hacking away at Planck's law. He tries to understand it. He discovers that there are logical inconsistency in Planck's derivation, and he finds that this Inconsistencies can be made to disappear if one really assumes that energy is localized in this quanta of light, exactly as he had assumed in the photoelectric effect. By the way, Planck never liked that idea. Uh, even in 19, uh, I think, 14 when, or 13, when he uh, got Einstein to move to Berlin, he introduced Einstein to the academy by uh, referring to his idea of the quantum of light as a sin of his youth. Huh? So, and Planck is ironically often called the inventor of the photon. Huh? So this is how people pay attention to history. Okay. 
1909, so a few years on, Einstein not only associates these later so-called photons with energy, but also with a momentum, and he writes it like this, so energy times uh, energy divided by C, or you can also write H over lambda, but it is a momentum in the direction of the wave vector. I remind you, the wave vector is, is by magnitude 2 pi over the wavelength, and, but it is a real vector, while wavelength, of course, is not. And then you come the first time that ghost fields enter. So he has now this phenomenon of light, and he knows it's associated with waves, electromagnetic waves, since Maxwell's discovery, but also with particles, something Newton had already speculated about. Except for Newton, these particles were streaming in straight lines until they met some interface, and uh, where they interacted with with particles in the interface and then went on in straight lines again. So Einstein was speculating that uh, this can be put together, these two phenomena, heuristic phenomena, that there are waves and particles by saying that the particles really carry energy and momentum and the electromagnetic fields and waves, uh, are there only to tell those particles where to go. They don't carry energy and momentum, we propose, and therefore he said that they behave like ghost fields. So that's where the name ghost field comes from. Okay, also in 1909 were the famous gold foil experiments of a bunch of people. One of them was Rutherford, but Rutherford also gave an explanation two years later. Uh, by the way, in 1908, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. So it's not that he won his Nobel Prize for this stuff. Hmm? So <clears throat> he interpreted the gold foil experiments where they scattered alpha particles uh, of the, say, uh, the nuclei actually in, in, in gold foil, thin gold foil. So he concluded that what, what they saw meant that atoms are mostly void, they are empty space. Negatively, tiny charge, uh, charged and tiny electrons orbit about positively charged tiny nuclei. So that was the model he proposed, a planetary model of atoms. All right, not everything goes smooth all the time. Let's hop on. Sticking with photons and electrons, so we go to 1923, Compton in fact uses his, this idea of Einstein and the relations that Einstein brought down but also Einstein's relativity theory for electrons and to describe and compute by using simple scattering arguments, energy and momentum conservation of a two particle scattering process, that there is a change in wavelength of between the outgoing and the incoming X-rays, right? X-rays scattered off electrons in, in a graphene target. So theta here is a scattering angle and uh, k are the wave vectors of the x-rays, the incoming and the outgoing k, and here is where theta is defined, yeah? just inner product. So this combination h over mc shows up, and it's then named because it has the dimension, physical dimension of a length, right? So this is dimensionless here. Here are wavelengths. So this is called the Compton length of the electron. Okay. But Compton didn't say electrons are that big or are waves. Uh, it was simply a feature uh, that uh, these numbers have, when you combine them with quantities, you get a length out of that. And uh, he, in his calculation, treated electrons as just as point particles, and so he treated photons. 1924. The boy now reverses in quotes uh, Einstein's uh, map, right? Einstein mapped waves into particles in the sense, I wrote here in parentheses, light waves. So he associated them with light particles, the photons, and the boy proposes equal rights for everyone. There is the electron, which is known to be a matter particle, so let's associate that matter particle with a matter wave, okay? And he didn't mean to say that the electron is now wobbly matter. Right, so it's, it's just an analogy to light wave as a wave associated with light. So here's a wave associated with matter, whatever that wave should be. 
But he also said that he picks up actually on Einstein's idea of the ghost waves that guide the photon. So he used the relativity theory for the material parts of the mechanical parts of the electron. And what he wrote down, that's the formula he wrote down in his thesis, that the wavelength he associates there is given by this formula. Well, what is it actually? It's H Planck's quantum divided by the momentum, the magnitude of the electron. And the momentum is written using Einstein's formula. It's mass times velocity divided by that square root, but we are downstairs here, right? So one over one over, and the square root pops up into the numerator. So this is actually h over p. But now he goes on and actually explains the hydrogen spectrum as follows. So he takes Rutherford's idea, model of the atom. So an electron, well, can do an elliptical motion, but let's suppose it does a stable circular motion about the proton, well, if the electron is guided in its motion by a wave in a stable way, right, that should correspond to a standing wave. So he said n wavelengths have to give the circumference of the circle. And using then his map, right, of momentum into wavelengths, he comes to the conclusion that the momentum of such an electron is an integer multiple of h divided by 2 pi r, the circumference. So, okay, let's introduce an abbreviation that was not done by De Broglie, but in any case, let's call h over 2 pi h bar, which everybody, of course, has seen nowadays already. So then when you write down the relativistic mechanical energy of an electron, so that's the kinetic energy, uh, rest energy times square root of 1 plus the square of its momentum divided by m square c square, but the momentum square is exactly h bar square n square over r square from here. And then you subtract the Coulomb energy. Okay, that's the formula. Now you have a formula given these parameters, but well, there is still this funny radius of the circle and you don't know what it is. Well, it should be a stable circular motion should be a distinguished thing. Well, the only way to find a distinguished R is to minimize, right? This has a unique minimum if, well, the numbers of the coefficients are right. And you see in a moment what I mean by that. And so you, he computes this and what he finds is basically a formula, a special case of Sommerfeld's so-called fine structure formula for the hydrogen atom energies. And here's what I mean if the numbers are right. See, there's a minus sign. So if uh, if that coefficient here gets too large, then you get suddenly negative expressions under the square root. And indeed, if you look at hydrogenic atoms where you replace the charge of the proton by z times the charge of the proton where z is a natural number, then you have z square e to the fourth standing here and making z larger and larger at some point, you have a catastrophe. Hmm? But for hydrogen, you are fine. That is, in fact, then a tiny, tiny number here for each n. So you can make a Taylor expansion, and what you get is this formula. All right, so these are now distinguished energies of an electron that is bound to a proton, coming from his idea of associating the motion of electrons with matter waves. Okay, but now let's continue. What does he do next? So. Recall what Planck said, individual emission, so, right, that means little n there, now that's a different n, this is just one. Initial, uh, individual emission of radiation at frequency nu by matter, well, is paid for by matter by a change of matter energy, and that would be it. No? So it, just a single emission, not, not n emissions of that same thing. And so therefore, the difference in the energies of the hydrogen atom, when you write them down, the rest energy cancels. I take the uh, Taylor expanded version, gives you these energies, H times nu divided by H, that means it gives you this frequency formula. And that's the famous Rydberg formula, okay, that he gets out of it. And except here, of course, there is not the empirical R, there is this formula for what R is, which was found early, of course, by Bohr, uh, you see, I skipped Bohr so far. Uh, if Bohr would not have done what he did, the boy would have presumably done the same thing just uh, 10 years after 
uh, Bohr. But uh, so also I mentioned Sommerfeld. Sommerfeld generalized Bohr's work to make it relativistic. Well, I told you uh, De Broglie actually worked also with relativity theory. So he did not work non-relativistically as you find it in textbooks. In his thesis, he actually used Einstein's relativity theory. So, uh, but he works with circles and Sommerfeld said, oh, we can also work with ellipses. So whatever he did for the Bohr model, he could have done also for the Bohr's model. So leave Bohr out of the story and nothing is lost. <clears throat> okay, now one year, no, actually two years later, we were from 1924, we jumped to 1926, showing us meta wave equation. So the boy was talking meta waves, but didn't have a meta wave equation. So what Schrodinger realizes, so and I write it now in more modern notation, uh, E is H bar omega instead of H times nu. And to have really a vector relation, I write P is H bar K. So this is nicely uh, analogous now for the energy and momentum parts here on both sides of the quality sign. By the way, note that there are the defining column here is on the side of the wave part. So that means De Broglie was reading from mechanical quality, energy or momentum and defining wave property. So that's uh, Einstein did it the, exactly the other way around. Yeah? But then there's also what I call the Fourier dictionary, right? So if you work with e to i kx and e to negative i omega t functions and apply d over dt, well, it pulls down an omega and the gradient of q, that is the space variable, pulls down an i k. And so you can write it like this. So what Schrodinger realizes is that the Newtonian energy, so now not relativistically written, that's the kinetic energy minus the Coulomb energy, right? Using the Broglie's dictionary here becomes that. But that here, according to the Fourier dictionary, can be read as a dispersion relation, right? So, I mean, multiply that whole thing through by e to i k x minus i omega t, right? And then use this and you end up here where instead of psi, you have e to i k x minus i omega t standing. So call that thing in more generality psi and you have Schrodinger's partial differential equation. The <clears throat> younger guys who have not yet really had some uh, study of partial differential equations, they may have seen such a thing. Don't worry about it too much here. Uh, I don't go too much into any details here, but uh, it should be clear that there is a B line coming from here and there to this equation. So this is what it is. So now what Schrodinger did next is he said, oh, let's seek standing wave solutions like the boy had been talking about standing wave. So what is a standing wave? It factors into a time dependent factor. Time is green here, so you can see it easily. And a purely space dependent factor. So that capital Psi becomes a little Psi purely on space, depending on the position of the electron actually, times an E to negative I some whatever E N T, no? E N over H bar actually is some omega here. And he finds that exactly for any of these E values where N is one, two, three. So you recognize that's exactly the formula the boy had found, in fact, Bohr earlier, with different, completely different ideas. But uh, so he finds that for each of these values, there are N square different little size that all have the same energy. So there's a, many possibilities are there to produce that energy with a standing wave. But it's a linear equation, so you can make a linear superposition of those special standing waves with some constant coefficients. And you sum of all the n's and all the degeneracy index n, that means there are n squared different d of n, right? So that you sum over, and that's the general solution. If you do that, and then form these expressions, that's all what Schrodinger also finds in 1926. And you define basically the absolute value square of psi, and you define a quantity that has the is a vector quantity. So that's the gradient of that psi multiplied by the complex conjugate. And then you take just the imaginary part. And don't worry how it comes up with all that, but multiply by h over m. So then these two quantities jointly satisfy what is called a continuity equation. Yeah. So people who have had calculus three then have heard of the divergence theorem, right? If you integrate that quantity here 
over a domain with a boundary, then this becomes a boundary integral. And if you push that, make that domain bigger and bigger, and the boundary goes to infinity, and if that j vanishes sufficiently rapidly at infinity, then that part integration gives you nothing. But integrating over volume here, you can pull out a time derivative. So that means the integral of rho has a vanishing time derivative. And so that means that integral of rho is conserved. And so <clears throat> that's one observation Schrodinger makes. Here's another observation. Look, the time dependence of a single psi was e2, I mean, a standing wave, was e2 negative i e time over h1. So e2 linear in time with an energy e. Now here you form quadratic expressions here also. Okay. Now each psi is a sum of exactly this kind of little psi's with the e2 negative e and t factors. So if you take the product of any two of them and remember that the, exp that the product of two exponential functions is a single exponential function and the argument is just a sum of the original arguments, but one of the factors has a star, the other one doesn't. So that means the star changes the minus i into an i. So you get the difference of two different energy values times time. So that's what you see down here. That is what Schrodinger realizes. And these are exactly the hydrogen frequencies when you remember what <clears throat> had been discovered earlier. So he gets besides himself with joy and interprets multiple of rho with negative e as the electron actual charge density and a multiple of j with negative e the electron current density and the idea is born that matter wave for schrodinger actually means truly a continuum jelly that wobbles around okay so it's a departure from the idea that the matter wave is only associated with particles and tells the particles how to move so he throws the particles out of the game also 26. By the way, he writes six papers in 1926. So he goes into an overdrive there, right? So don't be afraid. I just want to point out he generalizes a question to a many electron atoms, actually to many more particles than just that. But take a single nucleus. Here's the Coulomb energy. And now the nucleus has charge Z times E. Each electron has charge negative E. So it's negative Z E squared is the Coulomb factor one over the distance. Q sub n is the position of the nth particle. Here is now the second derivative operator, the Laplacian, with respect to the nth particle position. Okay, you sum of all n. And here is now all the repulsive energies of all the electrons with each other. So this is the generalization he finds. And doing the same identification of rho and j, except now in high dimension, he finds also the continuity equation. But now is, there is a problem, right? So you are living not in physical space anymore. This is a wave on a three n dimensional configuration space. And uh, he doesn't give it this idea of matter waves as jelly, wobbly jelly up easily. And he discovers a number of interesting mathematical relations, but eventually he realizes that this is not tenable. So he, but he doesn't admit that there may be particles after all. You know? So that's a little bit stubborn and hard-nosed. But in any case, these are very important discoveries he made. Still in 1926, so this is a remarkable year, Max Born writes four papers on Schrodinger's theory. Max Born, at that time, still in Göttingen. So he says, no, Schrodinger, your psi is not really uh, uh, spread out material continuum, but we should think like Einstein thought, and in fact, <laughs> like De Broglie thought also, and think of this psi as a ghost field, which is actually guiding the electrons such that they are more likely found where mob psi square is large and less likely where mob psi square is small. So he interprets mob psi square, which is a conserved quantity if you integrate it over all the Qs, right, and say, ask that integral to be one. That's a linear equation. You can make it to be one at initial time, then it's one at all time. He calls that a probability density for finding the first particle at Q1, the second one at Q2, and so on. So there are particles and there are ghost fields. That's the psi field. And then he says, but 
as long as I make that assumption that it's more likely where mod size square is large and I can compute mod size square, I don't need to find out how exactly the guiding is being done. But he is convinced it cannot be deterministic. He says, however, Frankel, that was a you know, postdoc or a visitor, Jakob Frankel from the Soviet Union, spent some time in Göttingen, told him that he thought it could be deterministic. So we are still in 1926. So Born goes on and develops scattering theory and has a nervous breakdown soon thereafter, so that should also be taken into account. But in any case, <coughs> uh, here is 1927. So it goes really bang, bang, bang. Here's the boy again. And he realizes, of course, that uh, let's stick to the guiding wave principle idea, you know, the ghost field idea, which he was proposing anyhow, you know, all being inspired by Einstein's ideas about photons. and. Uh, so he actually works down out what is the guiding equation. So he does something. This is a complex, for each T and Q, this is a complex number. And the complex number is a, a vector in two real dimensions. And so it has a phase if you're in a polar decomposition and a length. And so if rho is the absolute value of squared of psi, then the square root of the absolute value squared is the length, OK? And then is e to i phi. So he uses a different notation, but that's okay. And uh, so make that so-called polar decomposition at each point t and q. And then the continuity equation can be rewritten into this form. So where there was a j, you now have rho times exactly h bar over m gradient phi. Okay, rho times velocity. So he says. This is my velocity field, but velocity in three n dimensions. So that's a three n dimensional velocity. And he says, this field guides my particles. Think of a river that is flowing and there is a feather that lands on the surface of the water and it's being transported along with a flowing river. So that's the idea. Just put it in three n dimension and the velocity field is the gradient of some scalar function of T and Q. And here's the guiding equation. It writes down. Huh? Time derivative of the actual position is the velocity field at time t and q evaluated at the actual position. 1927 still. So interestingly, nobody picks up really on this idea of the boy. That's a different story. The idea was pronounced in front of all the luminaries. One of the harshest critics was Wolfgang Pauli. But in 27, he himself makes an important contribution while well, he had many contributions for earlier, he includes the notion of spin into the Schrodinger equation. And what basically, in a nutshell, what that refers to is replace all the three n-dimensional position vectors by pairs of a three n-dimensional position vector here, right? Q is in R cube. And an extra variable that can take only two values, let's say minus one and plus one. Okay, that's the spin variable. So, and uh, he introduces a triple of matrices, two by two matrices called Pauli matrices nowadays, and uh, explains some interaction of electrons with the magnetic field in the right way. So that doesn't matter really the details. In a nutshell, this is what happens to the wave function. It gets more variables. And he realizes that his earlier pronounced, 1925 pronounced exclusion principle corresponds to having anti-symmetric many body so-called spinner wave functions. So if you have spin included, these objects are called spinner wave functions. 1928, one year later, it, as I said, it goes bang, bang, bang. But these are important discoveries. Dirac manages to generalize the one body equation of Pauli to the relativistic realm by introducing yet another two valued variable. No, it's again minus one, one only. So, and um, I don't write down the Dirac equation, but that is the generalization. Uh, 1928, Darwin, that's that fellow, he is the grandson of the other Charles Darwin who invented the theory of evolution. So Darwin and also Gordon, I forgot to mention Gordon, he solves Dirac's equation for an electron in hydrogen, and he finds exactly Sommerfeld's fine structure spectrum coming out, which was known to be very accurate. But in 1930, two years later, Dirac 
tickles out from his equation through some reasoning we don't need to worry that there is an anti-electron and that was actually predicted even before Dirac's equation by Einstein in 1925 based on combining Maxwell's theory of electricity and magnetism together with his own theory of gravity. He concluded that there have to be for every charged particle that for which you find a space-time solution has to be one with the opposite charge and the same mass. So that was a prediction of Einstein, not very well known. 1930, Dirac discovers it. Well, he thinks actually first he has discovered that there is the proton in his equation with a positive charge. But then several people point out to him that by symmetry in his equation, it has to have the same mass as the electron. And then he said, okay, then it's a new particle with the mass of the electron and the charge of the proton. Well, things don't go smooth soon. After the war, as far as quantum mechanics goes, Bohm enters the story. And what's important to know is that Bohm was at that time a professor in Princeton. And he worked on a book, Quantum Mechanics, and which summarized the state of affairs, how quantum mechanics was understood. He goes with his book to the Institute for Advanced Study next door, so to speak, at the university, and talks to Einstein. And Einstein basically puts the finger on the weak spot. And uh, Boom goes back to his office. And there is another fellow, Murray Gelman, who later wins the Nobel Prize for the invention of the quarks. And uh, he relates the story that Boom says, I just came back from Professor Einstein. He put the finger on the weak spot in my book. Now I'm exactly as far as I was when I started writing the book. So then he thought about what he could do better, and he rediscovered Du Bois' theory, which Du Bois had proposed 25 years earlier, but didn't pursue for 25 years. And uh, so he explains what's really going on. He explains that Du Bois' deterministic guiding equation is perfectly compatible also with a probabilistic interpretation. He subsequently generalizes the guiding principle to the Pauli and Dirac equation, so all seems fine. But uh, strange things happen. He was a PhD student of Robert Oppenheimer, who happens to be a PhD student of Max Born, but these two guys didn't go along well. In fact, Oppenheimer didn't go along well with anybody in Göttingen. So if you read the biography of Max Born, it's really amazing. He, he almost had a nervous breakdown just because of Oppenheimer. And uh, in any case, uh, Oppenheimer is on record with making this comment. We may not be able to prove Bohm wrong, but we can surely agree to ignore him. So if you want to know what is going on there, you have to really go to history and read what was going on. Now we go on, indeed, to 1964. Bell's seminal contribution. Well, Bell actually reads Bohm's papers, and he takes them seriously. And he is intrigued by what Bohm wrote. And he ponders the matter because he realizes that Bohm's theory is clearly very non-local, right? And non-local, of course, Newton's theory is also non-local. That means, if, uh, I mean, particles arbitrarily far away can influence each other instantaneously. But that influence diminishes dramatically with distance. But in, in Bohm's theory, it doesn't diminish with distance, right? And uh, so he wonders whether somebody smarter than Bohm, possibly more creative, could come up with something like that, but uh, which observes Einstein's idea that there is a speed limit, that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And he discovers this famous Bell inequality, that uh, there are three different possible matches, right? And if you have the probability that A matches B, plus the probability that A matches C, and the probability that B matches C cannot be smaller than one, whatever that should be, what is being matched here. But in quantum mechanics, in such a calculation, you get three quarter, right? And three quarters clearly less than one. And that means, since this is coming from assumption of locality, essentially, it means QM is not local. It's not a local theory, okay? Einstein was gone at the time. I wonder how he would have reacted to such a discovery. In any case, two years later, 
there is a fellow named Edward Nelson, actually, who invents stochastic guiding principle that is compatible with Schrodinger's equation and Born's probabilistic interpretation. And his velocity field, field in quotes, uh, it says has a regular part and a fluctuating part, a stochastic part. The regular part coincides with the de Broglie Born velocity field. The strange thing is that our own Shelley Goldstein managed to convince Nelson that his theory is non local. And Nelson was convinced that physics has to be local, so he painfully abandoned his theory. I mentioned Goldstein. Well, here are Dürer, Goldstein, and Zangi, who start with a major publication in 1991. I mean, they start collaborating early, of course, but they published in 1991 for the first time. So they begin with laying down rigorous foundation. By rigorous, I mean conceptually rigorous, and partly, of course, also with epsilons and deltas, but uh, in any case, conceptually rigorous, the foundation of the de Broglie Bohm theory, and they sanction it Bohmian mechanics, and that's what Professor Goldstein spoke about last time. And the rest is history. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, um, Michael. Uh, we are going to um, open the floor and uh, uh, allow people to make uh, comments or ask questions. Uh, yeah, I'll be happy to answer questions if I understand the question. <laughs> Thanks for the comments, by the way. See in the chat. So, Michael, while uh, people are preparing uh, to think about questions, you mentioned something. Um, you gave this feather on uh, on the wave on 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 the water uh, river analogy. Can yeah. you um, explain a little bit why that analogy could be a little bit mis misleading as well? Sure, because uh, that pictures it too much directly in the real world, right? I mean, in the physical world as we see it. And uh, in our macroscopic realm, right, relativity theory rules supreme, right? So we don't see really deviations from relativity theory, which is a great mystery that we have to somehow put together that how is it you think that uh, relativity theory can be a microscopic principle possibly uh, because of the non-locality that Bell proved uh, and which was confirmed in experiments, of course, later on, uh, that quantum mechanics predicts when you do microscopic experiments with just very few particles, right? So uh, this is a big problem, how to put these things coherently together consistently. And, uh, but you could get an idea that, uh, well, you can do all this relativistically with this analogy of the feather to take it too seriously. So the guiding is being done really uh, in, a, in a high dimensional space, in a single point in a in this three n dimensional space corresponds to n points in three dimensional space, no matter how far they are apart. That's where the locality really comes from. Right. In particular, there was this uh, Quanta magazine article. Yes, yes, yes. Sort of, uh, said yeah. that Bohmian mechanics have been proven wrong because of. Uh, the... They missed the point completely. That uh, because, of course, they operate in physical space, right? And they are therefore restricted in their experiment to having waves run in three dimensions as time goes on. And uh, if you operate with more than one particle, that's just insufficient, right? So you cannot uh, produce uh, really all the phenomena predicted by this guiding wave theory in configuration space. Only if you send one particle at a time uh, far separated in time. Uh, then, of course, it reduces to the single particle things, but that's a very special case. Uh, I was also wondering if you could, um, uh, if you could provide a little bit of explanation about the um, the Fourier uh, dictionary terms uh, from, from way back when. Yep, let me go back. Uh, here we go. Hmm? Yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in uh, Fourier analysis, right? So what you uh, basically do 
if you have, uh, or where it's in particular useful, it's useful for a lot of things, no? but if you have a linear partial differential equation with constant coefficients, okay? So then you observe first that if you take a function that looks, um, let's take, yeah, okay. So here's one factor. Hmm? Of course, forget about that there's an h bar and an e here. Let's call that e over h bar just omega. Hmm? So you have an e to negative i omega t. Now here's also a psi of q. Suppose the psi of q for simplicity is also of that form, but e to i k dot q, where k is a three-dimensional vector and q is a three-dimensional space vector, right? And so now you have this product of two e to i k. So now hit it with this operator, the gradient, and hit it with the d over dt. What you see is that you reproduce the exponential function because, well, that's one of the features of an exponential function. If you take an x derivative of e to x, you get e to x. But if it's e to a constant x and you hit it with an x derivative, you get the constant pulls down and then you get e to kx. So, and that's what that says. It basically says that uh, e to ikx under that operation becomes just a factor k. And e to negative i omega t under this operation by hitting it with i d over t becomes a factor omega. So therefore you can convert partial differential equations with constant coefficient exactly into algebraic equations in omega and k. So that's the key idea. So here, of course, is not with constant coefficient. Right, so, but, uh, well, the, the beginning is. Hmm? So if you ignore that temporarily, then what I just said is perfectly right. And with a little bit leap of faith, you can cheat a little bit now and make that plausible. And that's somehow how Schrodinger actually got there. It's not what he published actually, because I think he felt that people will not take that seriously now. So he created some uh, much more inflated smokescreen story, uh, which however let him to, to the three n dimensional model very quickly. And, but historically there are some notes that are left from when he was pondering all this. And, and that's pretty much, I think, what he did in his notes. It's not what he published. Does that help? Yeah, that definitely helps a lot because I've, I've definitely studied the, I've been studying the Schrodinger equation for a while and I felt like I never fully understood why, um, why momentum was the gradient operator. Uh, and so I think this really helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah, and so maybe I pick up on that. Uh, and the, the key point is, of course, actually where this was, it's just mathematics here, right? Uh, this here is actually much more profound because here's where the physics is. So why would anybody do that, right? Of course, we know De Broglie did that because Einstein had the same formulas, except that the, the colon here was on the left side and here also on the left side. So Einstein came from knowing that electromagnetic waves are associated with the phenomenon of light and heat and so on. And, and uh, so he mapped those wave features K and omega into mechanical features P and E, momentum and energy, right? So now why would he do that? Well, of course you can say Planck. No? And well, once you have the energy part, energy and momentum are related in relativity theory, right? And frequency and wave vector, of course, are related for waves. So going from here to speculate there is also not too far-fetched. So why does one speculate about that in the first place? And that's why I went through the developments of the black body radiation. See, it's not really that Planck sucks this out of thin air, right? I mentioned, look here. This, of course, is the Kirchhoff part. Da. Now here's Kirchhoff's formula. How does he find that? Well, by, he looks for an analog formula of uh, the Maxwell velocity distribution, mm -hmm. and which, as I said, is the fourth power of velocity times e to negative, the second power of velocity divided by temperature with some constant. So, and But he knows. Uh, he is talking, after all, thermal equilibrium of radiation with, with, a, with a material object. And he is an atomist. And Boltzmann had explained thermodynamics in terms of statistical mechanics of atoms. So by some analogy reasoning, 
he speculates about such a formula and finds by empirical matching that that power here of the frequency has to be one and that one has to be three. So now from Boltzmann statistical mechanics, right, you know that the upstairs here, this is basically energy divided by temperature with a conversion constant. So that is the first appearance basically in 1896 that energy in, in the form of light radiation or heat radiation is proportional to the frequency. So that was already there that something like that had to be. It's not coming out of thin air out of nowhere. So that's an important point to understand Planck's formula and when Planck is there that is Einstein next and from there it's, it's plausible steps. But that was not just mathematics. This is clearly uh, a mix of method, playing with math, empirical results, and, and uh, lots of statistical physics. Okie doke. All right. No more questions? So let's thank Michael again. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was very useful. Very good.